Bé, bon dia a totes. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Vice Rector, Director General, dear friends and colleagues. I'd like also to greet Uriol and the technical team that have made this conference possible. And we at the European Observatory of Memories, we've wanted to create, to design this event, even though we've been working on these memories for the LGBTQ community, and but we wanted to make it more systemic. And I think that it's really worth to have this sort of partnership with the Catalan government and with the university on public policies related to this matter. And as Xavier Florenzo was saying, this is an important thing. It's important to talk about the memories, the struggles, and from societies that unfortunately are not as free as democratic as they should sometimes and this is why we resort to this subaltern notion the memory is a process is a democratic construction from the present looking on to the past but it is also a conflict is a struggles for this conflict and it's this transgression and this transgressiveness has brought these uh, struggles forward in the past, but also in the recent past for these communities. So this cycle of conferences will incorporate some other communities. Next year, we've discussed this with colleagues at uh, the European Commission to look at subaltern memories on the Roma people and the gypsies. And we will be approaching these from a cross-national viewpoint in a compared approach, incorporating all partners in our network throughout Europe. We are so happy to have her here because we haven't seen her for long. And I'm really pleased to introduce an expert on memorial transmission in the public space and on the creation of spaces in these subaltern memories on this conquest of the public space from different viewpoints, from different perspectives. And as a honorary professor of public art at the University of Arts in Berlin, I'm sure she can shed much light on this and very interesting information on this topic under a European perspective, but also well aware of the situation elsewhere in the world. Stephanie has participated on several occasions on memorials, mostly in Germany, but she has also published a pioneering book on researching and analyzing Holocaust memorials at the city of Berlin. And without further ado, let me thank the participation of the Catalan government and the University of Barcelona through the Solidarity Foundation. Let me stress, by the way, that these new programs that from the European Commission are being promoted, I think that are right on track, because I think it's right to call it citizens' rights, equality and values. It is also very appropriate to look at memory from the citizenship perspective, to look at memories considering the present day struggles, but also the recent past struggles, and also to interact this with cooperation and partnership programs, which is at the very heart of our foundation. And this is why we have so many pillars. And we have the director, Xavier, here with us. But it is will help us build a, a more democratic, a more just society. Even though we may be facing some shortcomings, some deficits, because we are in, it's not just a healthcare crisis, but we also have this political crisis, and we should be well aware of that. We have seen how the Andalusian regional elections or the French elections, well, 
you see how there's been a rise of the far right and this populism approach that completely disregards this sensitivity. And we really need to be well aware of these safeguards. So once more, I think that we should celebrate this type of programs at the EU level, incorporating gender justice, democratic memory, and discrimination, xenophobia, racism, and so on and so forth. So without further ado, because I'm sure that we will listen to Stephanie. And now. Thank you, Jordi, for uh, the introduction. I'm sorry that I don't uh, speak Catalan. Very sorry. Good morning. I'm very pleased to be here and to speak at the beginning of the conference. Many thanks for the invitation to EUROM, to the University of Barcelona Solidarity Foundation, and to Oriol, Jordi, Fernanda, and Ricard, and everybody else in the team. My presentation gives a short overview of some remarkable monuments and memorial installations in public space in various European countries. Some of them are dedicated mainly to homosexual victims of persecution by dictatorial and fascist regimes, especially to victims of persecution under the Nazi regime. Other monuments focus on the recent past and the present and have emerged in the context of the gay, lesbian, bisexual and transgender movement's commitment to equal rights and societal, societal recognition. In my lecture, I will first present some concrete examples from European cities. Afterwards, as the organizer of the conference have requested, I will focus on the National Homosexual Memorial in Berlin. The impression is obvious that the essential questions and discussions around this Berlin monument are similar to debates in other cities. Some of these questions are asked and negotiated anew again and again. Uh, is this okay with a loudspeaker? I think sometimes it makes boom. No? Can you understand me? Lower? Okay. Okay. Let me begin with a few reflections. Remembering and commemor commemoration are always in a field of tension between the past and the present. Many monuments and memorial installations to gays and lesbians refer to the oppression of these groups by dictatorial regimes, especially to exclusion, persecution, and multiple murders by the Nazi regime in Germany and in the occupied countries of Europe. If we compare the genesis of these monuments with the genesis of other monuments, however, we see that here the remembrance of historical persecution is particularly strongly linked to the concern of the initiative groups to set a visible sign for their own current self-assertion in the present time. Remembering and commemorating is much more than just to mourn the dead. It's about asserting oneself in an environment that is still full of resentment from subtle rejection to outright violence. A physical permanent monument in public space is always at the same time a self-affirmation of one's role in society. The activists who campaign for such a memorial are usually members of the younger, younger generation and stand up for their rights with a self-confidence and imagination. This also has an impact on the aesthetic concepts Members of these initiative groups are usually particularly open to unconventional artistic ideas. However, a lot of time passes from the first demands for a permanent monument in public space through the debates to the realization. Setting up monuments requires a lot of patience. 
10 or 20 years are not unusual. Battles must be waged against political and social rejection. Money must be found for realization. And efforts to find an appropriate artistic form often lead to serious conflicts among the initiative groups themselves. Allies are sought, networks are formed. However, ri rivalries often arise when it comes to the dedication of the monument. Strategies for forming alliances often leave injuries. Politics and administrative bureaucracies require compromises. Science and research bring new insights to the topic. In the best case, a monument dedication can help promote public recognition of the mo moment's purpose, monument's purpose. In the worst case, memorialization remains merely a symbolic political act to cover up political failures and draw a line under them. In many countries and cities, monuments for gays and lesbians have been built in the last decades. I will present some of them to you now, some in more detail, others in short keywords. Here I will focus on Western Europe. In Eastern European countries, politics and the church have largely rejected and forbidden gay and lesbian monuments in public spaces due to their homophobic and transgender hostile attitudes. In some countries, for example in Belarus, the repressions, has even, the repressions have even become worse due to the political crisis and to the war against Ukraine. Individual projects such as the Warsaw Rainbow 10 years ago are a major exception. They remained temporary. The monument by artist Julita Wojcik was in the form of a large steel arch covered by more than 20,000 artificial flowers in rainbow colors. The arch was first erected in front of the European Parliament in Strasbourg in 2011 to mark Poland's presidency of the European Council and then moved to Warsaw, Warsaw in 2012. There it led to heated debate. It was opposed, opposed by the church and by right-wing extremists and had to be guarded day and night by police officers. It was set on fire six times, once it was even completely destroyed and restored again. People threw rotten eggs against it, and finally it was removed in 2015. Many people had campaigned for the rainbow to remain. However, the artist explained that her work had no ideological meaning whatsoever. She said that she had created the rainbow as a temporary project from the very beginning. With my next example, I'm going back more than two decades, and although I'm focusing on Europe today, I want you to take a look to the United States for good reason. The most significant early example of a gay monument, and probably the first ever, is sculptor George Siegel's Gay Liberation Monument in New York City. It shows a white painted bronze ensemble of a homosexual couple and a lesbian couple in a relaxed pose. The artist created it back in 1980 on behalf of a private foundation that wanted to commemorate the 1969 so-called Stonewall Rebellion in New York City. At that time, a raid, a police campaign, took place against the Stonewall Inn on Christopher Street in Greenwich Village, a bar which was frequented by homosexuals and drag queens. This police action was followed by protests and solidarizations by the first demonstrations and in the period that followed by the formation of the so-called gay liberation movement. 
Initially, however, the gay liberation movement could not be, uh, the, sorry, the gay liberation monument could not be erected as planned in the neighboring Sheridan Park. Violent protests by local residents have prevented the installation there. So the sculptures were moved to the grounds of Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. There it was damaged several times by vandalism. A second version erected in a park in Madison in the state of Wisconsin was also attacked. It was not until 1992, after long controversial discussions, that the monument was inaugurated in Greenwich Village at the place that had been the historical turning point in the struggle for equal rights in 1969. The memorial is one of the few that addresses gay and lesbian love in an equally figurative way. This is due to the explicit wish of the sponsor and donor, Peter Putman. The memorial does not serve to honor the dead and does not refer to the persecution under dictatorship. It shows no stylistic references to traditional memorials, but with its figurative, alienating realism, it is anchored in the artistic development of the time. With its extraordinary formal language, it has set standards for contemporary memorial art, so it makes sense to look at it a little bit closer. George Siegel, one of the world protagonists of environmental art, took real people as models. He wrapped them with plaster-soaked bandages, then roughened the exteriors by hands, then cast the hardened plaster forms in bronze and painted them with white paint. The essential result of this technique is not naturalism, despite the similarity of detail and despite the human scale, but on the contrary, the result is extreme alienation, especially in public space. The monochrome white-gray skin of the figures create a fictional impression as if a moment of everyday, everyday life had been permanently frozen, as if the figures were released for contemplation while people walk around them and touch them, yet they are clearly kept at a distance. George Siegel has similarly created other environments that are outstanding examples of contemporary memorial art, such as the sculpture group The Holocaust in Lincoln Park in San Francisco. The game monument in Greenwich Village is neither dramatic nor symbolic in design. It expresses no mourning, no protest, and no assurance of victory. It shows the loving devotion, the physical touch, as everyday moments of the relationship of couples. In 1984, the Mauthausen Memorial Museum the first memorial sign was erected to explicitly commemorate the homosexual victims of the concentration camp. The memorial sign has the shape of the triangle, which was used at that time to mark the different prisoners' group, groups. The memorial plaque is made of old pink marble, so it has the color assigned to male homosexuals at that time. They were marked with a rosa winkel, the pink triangle. The words, totgeschlagen, totgeschwiegen, beaten to death, hushed, dead, silent, these words indicate that discrimination against homosexuals continued after 1944, 45, and that a real discourse on repression had not yet been established until now. The Mauthausen Memorial plaque served as a model for other plaques of the same or different design in the memorial museums of Sachsenhausen, Buchenwald, Dachau, and here in Neuengamme. As well as at the memorial sites in other countries. 
The rosa winkel, the pink triangle emblem, was also used outside of memorials in numerous monuments and commemorative signs of the gay movement. For example, in San Francisco, there is an entire pink triangle park was created. Or in Tel Aviv, Sydney, Anchorage, Montevideo, San Juan in Puerto Rico, Cologne, and many other times. In Warsaw, two gay activists had planned in 2007 to erect a monument in the form of the pink triangle to the gay victims of Nazi terror. However, despite some support from Warsaw, Warsaw city parliamentarians, the realization did not succeed. The memorial plaque in Mauthausen was the result of an initiative of Austrian homosexual associations. Its design follows the reinterpretation of the pink triangle. Originally, the mark was sewn onto the prisoners' clothing in the concentration camps and served the SS guards to identify the groups. In the 1970s and 1980s, however, this control and marker signs of the SS was transformed into a positive and self-conscious collective identifier of the homosexual movement. The equilateral triangle is particularly significant in proportion theory and as a symbol in art history. In the memorial context, it is used primarily as a graphic sign and information carrier for the survivors of the camps and their organizations. In concentration camp memorials and cemeteries, the triangle is used as a design element for honoring the dead victims of Nazi persecution. Especially in the context of the LGBTI movement, many contemporary artists use the triangle in their designs for monuments and memorial signs to gays and lesbians varying it in different ways. This ignores, however, the fact that the historical pink concentration camp triangle was only applied to male prisoners. There was no special identifying sign for lesbian women in the Nazi concentration camps. Lesbian women also did not form a separate prisoner category in the camps. They were intimidated in other ways. Lesbian women were sent to camps not nearly so often as gay men, to put it more precisely, only in individual cases, and then usually categorized as political prisoners or, or as so-called asocials. The special circumstances of the persecution of lesbian women by the Nazi regime were not researched by historians until in the recent past. In the current debates about the dedication and about the design of monuments, the, parliament, the, par, I'm sorry, the parallels and differences in the nature, in the extent, and in the severity of the persecution of gays and lesbians under this dictatorship play a major role. I'll come back to this at the end of my lecture. The Homo mon Monument in Amsterdam was realized in 1987. You find a beautiful picture in the middle of your program. I just saw this this morning. The monument is located at the Westermarkt, right in the center of Amsterdam, a large square which is surrounded by canals. The dedication of the monument does not only refer to homosexual victims of National Socialism, but includes all homosexual people in the past and present who were and who still are oppressed or murdered because of their sexual orientation. The initiative came from Dutch gay and lesbian groups. It dates back to individual actions by activists in the 1970s and received a major impetus in 1979 from a parliamentary submission supported by a coalition of various organizations, including international ones. This was followed by the establishment of the Homo Monument Foundation, 
and by the formation of a committee that determined the central location and held an art competition. The artist Karin Dahn had developed her design from the concentration camp triangle, which I had mentioned before. She designed an expensive floor sculpture composed of pink, pink granite triangles. As an expensive overall concept, the installation, though framed by linear floor markings, is not easily to discover. The three angles of the triangle are aligned with historically and currently significant points in the urban space of Amsterdam city. As triangles within a triangle, the three angles perform different functions and are each specially designed. One triangle reaches beyond the, the K wall into the Kaiserskracht canal. With its steps, it's meant to symbolize the present. The triangular element in the water serves as a place of remembrance and celebration. It is oriented to the national monument on the dam, Amsterdam's central liberation and peace memorial dedicated to the victims of the German occupation during World War II. The second triangle is intended to symbolize the future. It has the form of a platform for resting and serves as a meeting point. Its outer point is directed towards the headquarters of the COC, the main Dutch organization for the rights of the LGBT, lesbians, gay, bisexual, and trans. The COC, the Center for Cultural and Leisure, was founded in 1946 and is the oldest still existing LGBT organization in the world. The third triangle embodies the past. It refers to the neighboring Anne Frank house. It also contains a line of poetry from the context of the Dutch gay movement. I, uh, quote, I make a quotation, such a boundless longing for friendship by Jacob Israel de Haan. The Amsterdam Homo monument has not provoked ag aggressive uh, protests. This is probably due to the legendary Dutch tolerance, but it's also due to its design. The large form created a kind of communicative city square. The triangular emblem also serves as an architectural design principle for various inviting special areas. Thus, it is up to passers-by to interpret it either as a symbol as you're associated with Nazi terror and gay self-confidence or as a pure geometric element for a city square. A monument of Part, particularly in artistic interest is the Bronze Angel in Frankfurt am Main. It was created in 1994 by Rosemarie Trocke, whose work is close to conceptual art. The dedication to the homosexual victims of the Nazi regime is expressed in the inscription of the plinth. The text also warns of ongoing persecution. For her work, the artist used the damaged plaster model of an angel with ribbon, a lost angel from a sculpture group at the Cologne Cathedral. Rosemarie Trockel made a black bronze cast of it, but beforehand she added a violation, a wound, to the sculpture in the wax cast by separating the head from the torso and put in, putting it back on, twisted, with a visible fracture. In this positioning, the head of the angel seems to turn towards the courthouse behind it, which can also be interpreted as a symbol for bending or twisting the law. Rosemarie Trockel herself referred to Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, the backward-looking 
prophet who embodies mercy and compassion, but also androgyny. In addition, other references can be found, including religious ones, for example, in the small square whose design is part of the overall concept. Two circles enclose the monument, one formed by four batches, the other by four box hedges. This resembles the famous art historical motif of the Madonna in the Rose Grove, Madonna del Rosetto, Madonna en la Roseleda. The monument is located in the center of Frankfurt's homosexual culture and subculture. It came about through the efforts of the initiative Memorial Gay Persecution. The Red-Green City Council of Frankfurt agreed, but did not give any money. The initiators had to finance the art competition and the realization themselves with the help of donations. The Stolpersteine, the stumbling stones by the artist Gunther Demnig, can now be found not only in Germany, but all over the world. The artist lays stones in the street pavement, which are made of concrete, in the dimension of old paving stones. The surfaces consist of shiny gold press plaques, into which the names and life dates of people are stamped who once lived here and who were murdered by the National Socialists. Gunther Demnig's Stolperings, uh, Stolpersteine, Stumbling Stones settings are always accompanied by grassroots activities, initiated and supported, for example, by school groups or residents or surviving descendants of the victims. Like no other project in the field of commemoration, it has developed from the idea of a small marker in the mid-1980s into a popular success story, the largest decentralized memorial in the world, as it likes to be called, with more than 80,000 stones in Germany and other countries. In 2015, the first stumbling stone was also led in Spain, in Navas, Catalonia. In 2013, the first stumbling stone was led in Berlin for a homosexual victim, the dancer and choreographer, sorry, choreographer Fritz Heilscher. He died in a subcamp of the Sachsenhausen concentration camp where a particularly large number of homosexuals were murdered. Salzburg was the first city in Austria where Stolpersteine were led. A few later in 2012, there were, for the first time, five stones for homosexual victims. In Munich, after years of discussion, a memorial dedicated equally to lesbians and gays persecuted under National Socialism was inaugurated in 2017. For this, they chose the site of the former Inn Schwarzfische, the first gay bar in Munich, where also the first major raid in 1934 took place. The monument by Ulla von Brandenburg shows a colorful floor mosaic, which is supposed to stand for the tolerant urban society today. Here in the competition design, the mosaic looks like a carpet. In the realization made of colored concrete, it looks a little different. The colors refer to the rainbow colors. The floor inlay also includes, you can see it, a pink triangle and a black triangle. A black in memory of lesbians, women who were often imprisoned as asocial, as I said before. So-called asocials were marked with a black triangle in the Nazi concentration camps. The memorial project was initiated by the Rosa Liste München, Pink List Munich, a political group that rep represents the interests of gays, lesbians, bisexuals, transsexuals, and intersexuals in local elections. Discussions in Düsseldorf also lasted for two decades. 
In 2021, um, the monument by sculpture Klaus Richter was inaugurated, a group of bronze figures holding one hand aloft and holding each other together with the other hand. It's dedicated to lesbian, gay, bi, queer, bi, queer, inter and trans people who were victims of Nazi persecutions, but is also intended to remind discriminated and um, uh, discriminated people today. In Vienna, too, the initiatives had been calling more than 20 years for the erection of a monument to homosexual victims of the Nazi regime. They were supported by the Anti-Discrimination Office for LGBTIQ Affairs, which the city of Vienna had already established in 1996. There were several competitions, two big conferences, and a whole series of temporary installations. I show only a few of them here. The location for the plant monument was also changed several times. Oh, sorry, it's so small. I hope you can see it. Der Rosa Platz, the pink place of Hans Kuppelwiese, the result of the first competition in 2006. A water service surface colored pink, reminiscent of the pink triangle. In the pink surface, the lettering queer. This was not realized because it turned out that no coloring dye is permanently harmless. The Mahnwache, Solemn Vigil, by Ines Duyak, an artistic intervention at the site of Vienna Gestapo headquarters in 2010. Every week on Fridays, people with picture boards stood there for one hour. The boards showed photos of crying people bleeding from the ear, the pain of remembering. Too spät, too late, was a temporary installation by Carola Dertning and Julia Rode in 2011. The letter were made of resistant plants and they say non-recognition was too long. Schwule Sau, which means gay pig, by Jakob Lena Knebel, a temporary installation in 2013. The artist used defamatory terms with intention and presented them on his own naked body. Thus, homophobia is exposed and discussions are provoked. The result of a second art competition in 2020, oversight hands on a mirrored surface designed by Mark Quinn from Great Britain. Two men's hands and two women's hands are touching each other tenderly. However, the hands are brutally chopped off, perhaps a reference to the times of Corona. The competition result was not realized. The artist himself withdrew it, he said, that the realization would be too elaborate and wasteful in difficult times of existential reorientation and of global wasting of resources. Finally, the result of a new competition in May 2020, some weeks ago, Arcus, Shadow of a Rainbow, by Sarah Ottmeyer and Karl Kolbitz. The colorful rainbow colors symbol LGBTIQ movement are translated into various shades of gray. Perhaps an arcus, an arc of triumph, mourning and commemoration stand in the foreground. This uh, um, piece of art shall be realized still this year in 2022. I have reported about the Vienna project a bit more detailed because here it becomes clear how interesting especially temporary projects can be. 
Now, very briefly, some more examples from European city. cities. In Bologna, the memorial stone for homosexual victims of racist Nazi fascism has the shape of a tri triangle set into a square surface. It was inaugurated in 1990 on the anniversary of the liberation from fascism and it was initiated by Archie Gay, the largest Italian association for civil rights of homosexual and bisexual people. Also in 1990, a monument in Rome stands in a square where the German occupiers had gathered arrested people for deportation into the camps. Silhouettes with shackled hands emerge from a cotton steel wall. They represent five different groups of prisoners and they bear a concentration camp triangle on their backs. One of the five silhouettes bears the pink triangle. The Homo Monument in the Haag, Den Haag, Netherlands, was erected in 1993. An abstract metal sculpture suggests a moving, winding ribbon or a close fluttering in the wind. The artist, Theo Ten Have, has taken the shape and colorfulness in reference to self-confident homosexual life. He said, the green lawn symbolizes society, the blue base symbolizes awareness, the knot symbolizes conflict, and the transition from blue to pink in the upper part symbolizes liberation. About 5,000 people were murdered in the Nazi SS concentration camp Risiera di San Saba in Trieste. It's unknown how many of them were homosexual. In 2005, homosexual groups erected a black granite plaque with a pink angle on the memorial site. The inscription protests against all discrimination. You know, the following two monuments from your city and region better than I do. In Sitges, south of Barcelona, a monument was erected in 2006 on a beach that, as a popular meeting place for the gay community, has been subject to repeated police checks. The pink triangle bears the inscription, Sitges against homophobia. And in Barcelona itself, the monument honors the victims of sexual discrimination, lesbians, gays, and transsexual people. After a long controversy about its possible location in the surroundings of the Sagrada Familia Basilica, the monument has been finally located in 2011 in the Ciutadella Park, a triangle made from pink marble. I end this short overview with a look at London. There the tribute to homosexual victims is included in the general Holocaust Memorial. The very controversial new Holocaust Memorial planned for 2025 is also to include homosexual victims. It's not yet clear in which way. But there is something cheerful, surprising around Trafalgar Square. Homo and trans traffic lights. They were initially meant to be temporary in 2016 during Christopher Street Day, but now they shall remain permanently. The idea came from Vienna and has since been implemented in several other European cities, including Madrid. Now I come to the Berlin Memorial. One second. The monument to homosexuals persecuted under National Socialism was erected in Berlin in 2008. It's a national monument, which means its basis is a resolution of the German parliament. 
It is part of the ensemble of national memorials to victims of national socialism in the very center of Berlin, consisting of the Holocaust Memorial, the memorial to the murdered Sinti and Roma, the memorial to the victims of the euthanasia murders, and precisely the homosexual monument. This memorial has a particularly difficult and long history of origin. It began with the first Berlin memorial for the homosexual victims of the Nazi regime, the Triangle, in a downtown district which has been the center of homosexual entertainment culture since about 1900 and was particularly affected by Nazi raids and bans. In 1989, on the initiative of two homosexual associations, this commemorative plaque was erected there, based in form and inscription on the Mauthausen plaque mentioned at the beginning. Ten years later, the artist Salome erected the rainbow stele a few steps away from it, financed by a private initiative. Complementing the memorial triangle that looks back at those persecuted by the Nazi regime, this art object was designed as a cheerful sign of the present. A metal pen in the bright colors of the gay and lesbian rainbow flag with a pink tip reaching towards the sky. During the competitions for the Holocaust Memorial, that was around 1995, the Gay Memorial Initiative was formed, which later became the initiative named Commemorate the homo Homosexual Victims. Gradually, it succeeded in gaining the support of numerous politicians and civic groups for the idea of a national memorial. Together with the Lesbian and Gay Association, the initiative recalled the promise made by the Bundestag, the German parliament, in 1999. The promise said that the memorial foundation, which was established for the future Holocaust memorial, should also make sure the commemoration of the non-Jewish victims of national socialism. This parliamentary promise was the result of the decision at that time to dedicate the Holocaust Memorial exclusively to the Jewish victims and not also to the other groups of victims who had been persecuted for racist motives. Thus it was consequent that the other groups demanded their own national memorial too. In 2003, the Bundestag, the German parliament, decided to take up the initiative's concern and create a national memorial for persecuted homosexuals. An area was chosen on the southeastern edge of the Tiergarten, the large park in the very center of Berlin between the Brandenburg Gate and the Potsdamer Platz, directly opposite the field of Stiele of the Holocaust Memorial, which you can see to the right of the pink circle, which is the site of the homosexual. Monument. This area of the park had also been a popular meeting place for gay men for 250 years. The initiatives really, uh, sorry, the initiatives recalled, I quote, that the persecution and oppression of gay people continues to the present day. The memorial should therefore also be a place of self assurance. This reference to the present was explicitly included in the parliamentary res resolution, I quote, with this memorial we want to honor the persecuted and murdered victims, keep the memory of injustice alive, and set a constant sign against intolerance, hostility, and exclusion against gays and lesbians. End of quotation. A two-stage art competition followed with participation from the Lesbian and Gay Association and the Grassroot New Society for Visual Arts. Among the participant artists were internationally known protagonists. Most of them took up the initiative's concern to create a communicative place where the focus should not be on individual mournful remembrance but on encounter and dialogue. 
The design by the Danish-Norwegian artist duo Michael Elmgrim and Ingard Rexit was awarded as first prize. The monument was erected three years later in 2008. It has the shape of a monol monolithic cube, almost like a small pavil pavilion. However, it's hermetically closed except for a small glass window through which, oops, sorry, through which one can look into the inaccessible interior. The cube refers in form, material and proportions to the steely form of the neighboring Holocaust Memorial, which you see here. However, the cube stands on its own and is much larger in scale than one of those pillars in the large field. Looking through the stained glass window into a perspective narrowed interior, one sees a video projection developed by director Thomas Winterberg based on the conceptual idea of the artists Anne Green and Rexit. Two young men are immersed in an apparently endless kiss. The artists describe two essentials for their designs. The first essential, they said, is the knowledge that the visual picture of homosexual affection still generates great reservations and rejections in society. Despite all the progress made in the area of le legislation and despite increasingly tolerant social manners. Therefore, such caresses should be made, made directly visible in the midst of heterosexually occupied public space. In this way, the project could contribute to the formation of identity and to the appropriation of urban space. For this purpose, the artists choose the representation of a kiss, a tender and innocent act, they said, at the same time, a positive image that everyone could identify with, a permanent video. The second essential motive of their design is the single standing cube, which, as mentioned, quotes the stele of the Holocaust Memorial, but is larger and is a little bit slanted in an almost ironical way. One could have the impression that the cube is looking over or waving over to the Holocaust stele field. In this way, you see the field in the background. In this way, similarities of the homosexual victims with other victims groups are visualized, but also their special role as outsiders then and now. In addition, the hermetic looking concrete cube represents a protective space for the tender act of kissing. With its small viewing windows, window, it refers to the difficult tension between public and private. In the controversial debate that began after the inauguration, two points of criticism dominated. On the one hand, especially historians and representatives of memorial museums objected that the monument left no space and no point of contact for mourning commemoration of the homosexuals tortured and murdered in the concentration camps. Instead, they said, it serves to establish the identity of today's community and neglects in a self-centered way the honoring of the dead, to which this project should actually be dedicated. And they criticized that the adoption of the Holocaust Memorial's Stiller motive, Stiller motive, might give the incorrect impression that homosexuals, like Jews, were systematically persecuted with the intention of extermination. In fact, however, the jury had se selected Elm Green and Rexit's design precisely because it contains this consistent relation to the present day. Much sharper, however, was the gender critical protest against the video. Lesbian women, so it was said, had been forgotten and excluded from this monument because the video shows the kiss of two men. 
especially for a national mon monument, the suppression of the female aspects should not be tolerated. The result of this controversy was the decision of the Minister of Culture himself. The temporary installation of new videos by other filmmakers, which was intended to take into account the demanded same-sex perspective. The new video by Gerald Backhaus, entitled Kiss Without End, was produced in 2012. It shows five kissing scenes of male couples and female couples in different situations in which they are suspiciously observed by others. This is told in the form of small stories without special artistic quality, and it was enforced as a political intervention in the artwork of Elm Green and Drexit. The German parliament had explicitly underlined that the Berlin Monument should be a statement against the exclusion of gays and lesbians. The debate about the video, however, continues to this day. References to the special conditions of the persecution of lesbians under national socialism are mixed with arguments about the necessary same respect of homosexuals and lesbians today. In the years 2014 to 2017, the original video by Elm Green and Drexit was shown again for a while. In 2017, however, it became known that one of the two performances in the video was conspicuous for racist and sexist remarks. Therefore, this video will definitely not be shown anymore. Oh, sorry, it's so small. Since 2018, we can see a video by the Israeli artist Yael Batana. She also shows the various stories of kissing female and male couples in different times and situations. You can uh, find all the three videos on the website of the Holo uh, Holocaust uh, Memorial Foundation. You can see them. Here you can see Yael Batana on the right side of the group during the inauguration of the video. Let me come to end with some concluding remarks. Monuments are works of some of art, works of art whose aesthetic quality may still impress even after a long time. However, they are always documents of the concrete historical period in which the work of art was created. They are documents of the stylistic art movements of the time and documents of the priorities set by the initiators and by the sponsors for such a monument at that time. Therefore, a distance between monument and viewer is always present. Like any work of art, no matter how old it is and in what style it was created, memorial art always unfolds its, its effect in the present of the viewer and in the context of the respective societal situation. New individual experiences, critical reflections, and social changes always lead to new debates and interpretations. Especially in the case of our topic, it becomes clear how strongly the entire remembrance cultural context can change in just a few years. In Germany, for example, the conflict over whether the persecution of lesbian women during the Nazi era should be equated with the per persecution of homosexual men gradually loses its sharpness thanks to more extensive historical research. True, in Nazi Germany, only homosexual men were criminalized by the so-called paragraph 175. Many lesbian women, however, were persecuted intersexually, that is, in the context of other Nazi persecution strategies. For example, for political resistance, for nonconformist living, for prostitution, or for not being white, which means for racist movement, motives, 
for racist motives. Concentration camp museums in particular have been quite late in sharing these research results. This required the long-standing initiatives and demands of women's groups as well as lesbian and gay association in Germany. A monument for the lesbian inmates of the women's concentration camp Ravensbrück was realized just now, a few weeks ago, in memorial fair, a ball with the inscription, I quote, in memory of all lesbian women and girls in the women's concentration camp Ravensbrück and Uckermark. You were persecuted, imprisoned, also murdered. You are not forgotten. End of quotation. The ideas for this fair came in 2014 from the initiative Autonomous Feminist Women's Lesbians from Germany and Austria. However, the ceramic ball broke apart in the pottery firing kiln, almost a metaphor for the tension that has accompanied this project over years. So the inauguration in May had only a symbolic character and will be made up for in the fall. And the other groups of LGBTI plus movement, are they being included? The commitment of the gay and lesbian movement to equal rights and social recognition has shaped many previous monument settings, especially in the 1990s and in the first decade of the 21st century. However, this commitment has long since expanded to include other groups, such as transgender, queer, non-binary, and others. In these processes, the existing monuments are also being reinterpreted. In the best cases, they are open to a changed or expanded reception over time. And we see in current and future memorial projects these groups are widely included. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thanks a lot, Stephanie. Uh, we could uh, see this kind of uh, universe of memorialization and memorials, a kind of uh, transmission in a public s space. Also, not only memorial, it's about the stone and, and interventions of architectural and public art. Also, it could be performance and demonstrations, of course. And this uh, has to be uh, uh, pointed. So I'm giving the floor to the to you, to all of you, for any questions. We have some time for Q and A, so you can ask your questions, make your remarks. I've been talking too long, huh? <laughs> Everybody's tired. <laughs> Hello, good morning. I'm Santos. I'm here representing a, a union in Catalonia, UGT Union, and also the LGBTQ plus community. Your presentation has focused on memorials, on monuments uh, that we as activists have been always claiming to give visibility to the LGBTQ plus struggle. I would like to mention that our enemies despise our struggle. And for example, there's a despise by museums. Hello, testing one, two, three. One, two, three. It's canal dos, dos. Hello, testing one, two, three. One, two, three. Testing. Can you hear me, Stephanie? One, two, three. One, two, three. Is it working now? Okay. 
Okay, let me start again. No problem. I'm Santos. I'm representing here the LGBTQ plus group of um, UGT, uh, Catalan Union, and I'm an activist myself. And I was mentioning that our enemies, the enemies of our group, have always wanted to despise our struggle because they think that it's not an actual struggle and they believe that it is connected to fads or trends and it's superficial. So monuments and memorials give visibility to our struggle. But you haven't mentioned museum, like museum memory and what is included in museum. Because in the US, it's true that they have foundations, uh, Mason foundations that claim um, human rights and they do have LGBTQ plus memorials as of the Second World War that started to happen. But before that, they had attempts to claim and give visibility to the group. But in Europe, we don't have many museums, the one in Berlin, the one in Amsterdam, but they are tiny and residual. And we are lacking this claiming of human rights of the LGBTQ plus um, community in museum because it's very apparent that it, you are, if you're in a museum, you go through the main gate of history, right? You go down in history because it's something permanent. But many people believe that the LGBTQ plus movement is just a fad, a trend, something that started in the 60s with psychedelia and they despise our struggle. What do you think about including the LGBTQ plus um, concept in any museum as a, as a claim, uh, just like any other um, struggles like feminists. Um, I agree completely to your uh, sentences. Uh, I hardly know an, any larger museums which uh, deal with um, LGBTQ you uh, purposes you are right and um, I wish that I'm sorry I wish that uh, could be the fact yeah that's all I can say because I'm not um, I know the very small uh, museum in Berlin which is a private museum uh, sometimes gets some money from uh, sponsors or even from the uh, Berlin uh, Senate for certain exhibitions, but uh, that's all. It's uh, still there, very small. Yeah. I think that this should be included in um, cultural policies, right? It's easily said, not so easily done, and we have um, representatives of the administration that can attest to that, but we need public policies that include that in a cross-cutting manner that mainstream all perspectives, and that's why it's important to work in a cross-cutting manner. But as you have seen, there are many monuments and memorials that have been funded privately. It's like a, a permanent conquest, and you're more knowledgeable about it than myself, but it's about conquering the public space with these initiatives, uh, what has been subaltern and invisible for a long time. That's my opinion, just sharing it. Any other question? It's a remark that has to do with what you just said. Uh, there's the Schulis Museum in Berlin, right? Where they try to offer a memorial from a museum. But an important topic, and I wonder what you think, Stephanie. Very often, if you want to retrieve your, the memory, you need objects. 
objects to talk about, to exhibit memory objects. And unfortunately, LGBTQ plus memories are not tangible. They are not material. It's not that they didn't exist, but we don't know where they, where they are because they've been erased or they belong to highly concealed personal archives. So it's difficult to have them in museums. It's true that there have been projects in Spain and locally to try and create memory networks. And then we could discuss what kind of objects we would like to commemorate. I think in San Diego, in California, they took the first glory hole that was a to was taken from a public toilet and was taken to a public museum as one of the first known sexual encounter places in San Diego. So these things can be done, but we will have to discuss, in the case of Europe, museums are of a state uh, nature and they have public funding and, of course, there are political interests behind that. Um, probably the Catalan government is much more open to this kind of initiatives. I come from Madrid and I don't think the Madrid government would be willing to support a glory hole uh, being exhibited in a museum or any other initiative. And in the Reina Sofia Museum, we have more archive-like um, projects and there's this connection between the archive and the museum and it's about hosting collective memories, the Mer Mercury Collective um, that started in the 70s. They have donated everything that they have left of their collective memory to the archive and they are open to the public so it's good to show this to the public so that they can access to it in an easier manner and use them even if it's uh, in a temporary exhibition but it's very difficult uh, when you lack the material the tangible object to claim a memory that is there but you need to l put a lot of effort into it to retrieve it and with the help of public institutions yeah, okay. Hola. Yeah. Yeah, may I? Yeah. Pardon, I would, would like to make a very short, some very short remarks. Yes, thank you. Um, the Schwules Museum in Berlin, which you mentioned, uh, they have a lot of objects. I don't think that uh, the lack of objects is the problem. The problem has other reasons. And even if it was the problem, you uh, can very well make uh, historical museums with few objects and other media in different fields. Um, but talking on the other side about state museums, in, in Germany we have only um, one state historical museum in two, divided in two cities, Bonn and Berlin. So uh, maybe the museum should have another um, form of um, um, who, who buries it. Um, the Holocaust Foundation, um, you know that underneath the Holocaust uh, um, Memorial there is also an exhibition. Um, they um, partly also uh, try to include uh, changing uh, uh, exhibitions for the homosexual and lesbian persecution, but that's not what you meant. Yeah. Uh, pardon, there, there was another question there. I'm Montserrat Esquerda. I belong to the working group of historical memory of the LGBTQ plus group in Sitges and on Wednesday we opened an exhibition in the Sitges Museum based on a proposal, an initiative to claim a homosexual person who spent his um, last years in Sitges, Jose Zamora, a figurine artist who had worked in Paris theatres and in Madrid uh, during the Belle Epoque and then in the post-war period. And we wanted to present this project to the museum, not only because of the value of um, these artists, but also the uh, role he played in the 40s when he arrived in Sitges and he decided to spend long periods in Sitges 
because he found a certain level of tolerance and well he led a very open and free life throughout his life but this exhibition project has allowed us to discuss um, the community, the group in Sitges um, as of the 50s and 60s. And now we want to give continuity to this and organize an exhibition on the Sitges of the 80s and 70s. So we want to make it to the museum in Sitges with tiny exhibitions with this pretext um, that well, we have the artwork of these people and we want to talk about the LGBTQ plus um, group in Sitges, Sitges, which is um, the gay capital of Catalonia. So this has been the premise on which we've been working. It was not a question, it was just sharing some information. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. You're all invited. Pepito Zamora was not was not repressed. No, um, he belonged to the group of Antonio de Hoyos, Pero de Retana, somewhere imprisoned. Others w went to into exile. We don't know why, but he was not repressed. Uh, he was not a victim of repression. He he made it. He was able to live in Sitges in the post-war period. We do not have enough um, biographical data, but it's true that within that group, some went into exile and uh, were repressed, but he spent a quiet life in Sitges the last 20 years of his life. But in Madrid, he led an open homosexual life without many hurdles. We have Ricard Cuneza, our um, historian, who is from Sitges, and we have developed a project to organize a memorial space in Barcelona, and there's a part on the first floor, a permanent section on LGBTQ+. Um, there's history, and if we have some um, witness stories, that'd be great. You can be in touch, and we can include that. Hola, I'm José Antonio Frías. Can you hear me? Not, not much. Now, I'm a professor at the University of Salamanca at the Documentation and Library Studies Faculty. And I'd like to supplement what was mentioned by Moises. Not long ago, the General Directorate of LGBTQ Rights of the Equality Ministry granted me a project about the situation of sources, the condition of sources to gather data about LGBTQ people in Spain. And we have been talking here about museum, objects, memory, etc. It's all very scattered, I'd say. It's true that there are some art centers or museums that have um, worked hard, especially the Neumudejar in Madrid with the trans-feminist queer archive. They have incorporated all kinds of materials. It's true that the main problem lies with reaching out to the people who have these materials. They have included, for example, the Etaira Collective Archive. Um, this is a group of sex workers that um, just disappeared. And, but these are objects with a high memorial value, or the um, pink sachets in which um, they um, handed out uh, condoms. So the main problem is that intangible memory is key, the memory of spaces, of locations, of music. And I think that the challenge that we have ahead is to generate new stories, new narratives by incorporating different sources of information. Because sometimes, for example, prisons in Tefia, the 
agricultural colony where homosexuals were imprisoned by the Franco regime. That is being recovered as a memory site, or in Torremolinos, the Begonia Passage. I mean, there are some spaces that are being recovered, but sometimes the interpretation is not very accurate. What we need to do is to um, build new narratives about spaces, about locations, on the basis of objects, references, um, cultural references, literary work. It's the only way we have to recover the, that intangible memory that has been key and that we need to recover. Thank you. Hi. Uh, slight change of topic. Uh, my name is Kai. I'm just a high school student, so maybe it's a stupid question. But I wanted to like, know that most of these monuments are pretty cis-normative. And uh, this, this um, lack of representation of trans, non-binary, and even intersexual collectives, it's a it's a kind of erasure that our community uh, has been suffering always. And the question is basically like, what do we do with it? What do we do with the lack of representation of uh, the um, non-binary and trans identities in the artistic um, uh, areas? And uh, the lack of popularization of the existing representation of it? Um, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it's difficult uh, to give an answer. And how can I tell you what is to do to uh, make things better? Um, perhaps I can answer with uh, some thoughts about how memorials in public space um, work. Um, when, when we look back to memory uh, development in, in the public space, we can always see that the representation in public uh, space comes late. It comes always much later than uh, um, historical research, then discussions in the public, in the university, in the grassroots movements, in the initiatives. It comes late. Uh, we have at the moment uh, in Germany and especially in Berlin, although this very difficult debate, uh, uh, why uh, is the topic uh, of colonialism and the crimes of colonial uh, German colonialism um, uh, not really um, uh, arrived uh, in, in public space. We have uh, researchers for about six or seven years. We have uh, groups, uh, initiatives. We have this and that. And, we have in the center of Berlin, we have only one single um, memorial plate at the place where in 1886 uh, the German Reich and 12 other nations came together uh, to decide what they make with Africa, which is a huge story. And um, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, there will also monuments uh, to come in the next years, but maybe this will take some time and competition and different ideas. So I hope that uh, also what you say now, the lack, lack of representation in the public space will come later. Uh, I don't know how to uh, enforce it. Well, we, 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 we could increase uh, the public budget <laughs> to invest. Yeah, that's... Memory is always uh, low cost. Yeah. Maybe not in Germany. No. <laughs> but <laughs> if you take Spain as a reference, yeah. 
We no, have a lot of problems in also Spain and Catalonia in too. In too. Germany, uh, we don't uh, have enough money for many well, memorials. Yeah. We have the big state monuments, that's right. Yeah, uh, the they big are ones. very representative and some kind of problematic too. In this stand between the uh, central national level and the small uh, projects, there's a big yeah, difference. but we don't have a national level and yeah, we don't yes. have a small project. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. I mean, it, it's always a, a very big debate. Yeah. But we can begin also with, uh, I mean, uh, or we can begin with uh, the nomenclator, as you told, and this kind of symbolic changes could be, you know, changing, first of all, the references in the public space. But it, it will take so, 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 such a long time. More questions and we will bring this to a close. Before I forget... Uh, in the garden, al jardí, vale? Si no m'oblidaré de dir-ho. Last question and with this we wrap up Stephanie's presentation on this Q&A. Hello, I'm Charlie. I'm from the International Studies Barcelona Institute and I will ask in English because I feel more comfortable. You, by the way, it was very interesting. You referred to the idea uh, of LGBT rights as democratic, or at some point they were conflated with ideas of democracy. Do you think maybe we need to have caution in doing these things because it leads us to view LGBT rights as something Western or Occidental focused, uh, just as the idea of democracy? Do you think that we do need to have caution when we talk about these things because otherwise, it removes the internalized, uh, sorry, the internationalization of LGBT rights and makes us view them more as a Western concept. Was that a question? Was that a question? Or a statement? Yeah, I'm not sure if this was a question or a statement. I think it was a statement, right? No, uh, I'm sorry, I, maybe you, you speak very quick in English, um, you were uh, asking for the uh, international context and international. Yes, of course, uh, this is a big problem because uh, we have countries uh, where even uh, the existence of being homosexual or lesbian, especially homosexual, is uh, an existential uh, problem for life and they have death penalties and we should not forget uh, the uh, the um, real uh, how heavy problems are compared to ours that's that's what you mean yeah and we have to look at those countries right uh, thank you Maggie. thank you so we wrap up now. Thank you very much for your attention. The symbolism of this triangle is for organizations, um, civil society, the government, and um, everyone else can keep making headway in this discussion. Thank you very much. See you later.